Hi, my name's Matt Knight, and today I'm going to be talking to you about my research into the deliberate destruction of Bronze Age metalwork. I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers for putting together such an incredible online event, and also thank you to you all for attending today. I'm uh, really excited to be sharing my results with you. The deliberate destruction of Bronze Age metalwork is widely recognised across Europe. Swords and spears were bent, burnt and broken and thrown into rivers, Axes and ingots were smashed and piled into hordes. Ornaments were crushed, contorted and placed in certain landscapes. This is a topic that's long attracted the attention of archaeologists, most commonly with the aim of understanding why was this done? What purpose did this destruction serve? These were functional objects willingly decommissioned. Was it for offerings for Bronze Age deities? Or did the destruction serve a more mundane function? for scrapping and recycling. My initial approach to this research was focused on this question of why, which has been the subject of much debate. Should we see the destruction and deposition of Bronze Age metalwork as sacrifice or scrap? Back in 2014, I proposed a PhD that would look at this phenomenon in the context of Southwest Britain and assess what the destruction and deposition of metalwork meant to the communities living in this area. This involved a study of the metalwork from the region, looking for signs of destruction on these objects from throughout the Bronze Age, which included weapons, tools, ornaments and metallurgical waste. However, there was one overarching problem that kept rearing its head, which is how do we recognise intentional destruction? Although lots has been written on the topic, this basic question of how were things destroyed had never been adequately addressed. With this in mind, I changed the emphasis of my PhD. I decided to explore how objects were destroyed in the Bronze Age as a way of understanding why. For instance, did destruction require specialist skills and knowledge? Did it require a metal worker? Or could any old idiot with a hammer do it? If it was a skilled activity, what does that tell us about the event of destruction? Was it a spectacular event or something more trivial? By appreciating these processes, one can begin to infer whether they required specialist knowledge, equipment or skills, and by extension, the types of individuals who may have been involved, such as metal workers. Further to this, we can develop an understanding of the biography of an object or group of objects immediately prior to deposition. This can then help us understand why they may have been deliberately damaged in the first place, and whether this might be linked to functional or sacrificial rationales. I realised early on that to explore this properly, it was necessary to conduct some experiments that used replicas of Bronze Age objects and then test different methods of destruction. It also became clear that the people I needed to speak to were metal workers and experimental archaeologists, the very people who worked with uh, these metals regularly. I was fortunate during my research to spend a couple of days at the Terra Mare di Montale Archaeological Park in Italy. This is a really wonderful archaeological facility and castings of Bronze Age swords regularly take place in a very public event. And when I was speaking to those doing the casting, I asked a fairly basic question. How would you break up a Bronze Age sword? They looked at me fairly blankly and said, well, what do you mean? I said, exactly that. How would you break up a sword? And they replied, Oh, we do it every day. The team there cast swords for the public. It's an entertaining show. They hold up the sword for all uh, to see, and once the public have dispersed, they stick the sword back into the fire, heat it up, smash it to pieces with a hammer, and then throw it in the crucible ready for the next casting and the next public show. So almost immediately, I had an answer to this very basic question that really doesn't appear anywhere in the uh, academic literature on fragmentation and the destruction of Bronze Age metalwork. However, the people who work with this material regularly and understand the properties of bronze instinctively knew and know the best ways to treat and fragment the material. When I asked a variety of metal workers about some of the more quantifiable aspects, like what temperature should the bronze be heated to, or what tools are best for breaking the bronze. The answers I received were experiential. They related to the colour, smell and feel of the material and the event. I'm aware 
I'm preaching to the converted here, but it really highlighted to me the importance of not just studying the artefacts, but also considering the materials and processes involved in the making, using, and in this case, breaking of Bronze Age objects. When I came home from this trip, I was keen to continue this train of investigation and consulted with various other experimental facilities and metal workers. I was fortunate to meet and work with the expert bronzesmith Neil Burridge, who is based in Cornwall, near where I was undertaking my research. I was also fortunate to re receive some funding towards the production of replicas. These were based on artefacts I was studying from southwest Britain, in particular swords, spearheads and socketed axes. These are objects that are commonly found deliberately damaged in the Late Bronze Age across Britain and uh, continental Europe. The replicas were cast in sand moulds and were based on examples for which I had compositional information, as well as examples that were suspected to have been deliberately fragmented in the Bronze Age. This would then allow me to compare the results of my experiments with fragmented archaeological artefacts. So I then set out to explore what is the best way to break bronze objects. Obviously, this was already partly informed by my experience talking with metal workers, and I knew that heating bronze to high temperatures made the metal brittle and easy to break when struck. Nonetheless, there were four elements I wanted to explore, which were what is the impact of heating the metal beforehand versus leaving it unheated? I'd seen what happened when the metal was heated first, but what did it look like when you didn't heat the metal? Were different tools more effective than others? In my experiments, as you'll see, I utilised a bronze hammer and chisel as well as a stone hammer. Did certain objects break differently to others? Would an axe break differently to a sword, for instance? Some of the literature I've read I had read indicates some objects were easier to break than others. I wanted to test how true this was. And what was the impact of metallurgical compositions in all of this? This is important because bronze in the Bronze Age is typically composed of tin and copper, occasionally with low amounts of lead. But too much tin or too much lead can have an impact on the microstructure of the bronze and how the material behaves, and it will impact aspects of its material qualities like toughness or brittleness. Perhaps the best way to explain some of my results here is to show you a video of my experiments involving heated objects, which is basically just me hitting things with a hammer. What you're seeing here is a sword that's been heated up to around 500 to 600 degrees Celsius in a kiln. It then comes out in a very brittle state, and you can see my very poor attempt at fragmenting the sword using a hammer and chisel. Um, you can tell I am most certainly not a metal worker. And it became quickly clear that the chisel was actually quite redundant and it's easier just to hit things with a hammer, as you can see here with the spearhead. And here a socketed axe was broken easily, but heated to such a high temperature it entered a very brittle state and basically exploded on impact. As a side note, I can highly recommend smashing objects as a fantastic way to relieve PhD stress. Here are the results of those experiments and these should look familiar to anyone who's ever studied Bronze Age fragments. We have the sword and the spearhead here in multiple roughly even pieces. You can even see chisel marks on the sword. And here we see two different axe heads which were both heated to uh, about six or 700 degrees Celsius and uh, entered that brittle state that, that meant that they uh, fragmented into lots of little pieces. I'm afraid I don't have a recording of me hitting unheated objects because this would be longer than the talk itself and because it just proved to be a really terribly ineffective method of fragmentation. It made me pull faces like you see here on the left. The axe explosion you just saw took only three hits to break when heated. I struck another replica of the same composition with a bronze hammer 105 times and it failed to break the axe when it wasn't heated. You can see that on the bottom right here. The unheated examples were much more deformed in the process. They were much harder to fragment. They required more force, more energy and more effort. And ultimately, they left a lot more surface damage on the objects. Importantly, this sort of damage is rarely seen on Bronze Age fragments, which suggests that heating and fragmented objects was by far the most common method in the Bronze Age. 
And this is reinforced when we compare the broken heated replicas with the artifacts on which they were based. Here you see the fragments of my replica sword at the top compared with a fragmented sword from the St. Earth Horde in Cornwall. And here we see comparable fragments of spearheads, the one on the right from a watery deposit on Dartmoor. And finally, comparisons between axe head fragments, uh, the bottoms, the bottom ones obviously being the original artifacts. Hopefully you'll agree the fragmented fragments, uh, the heated fragments provide really nice parallels for the archaeological artifacts. And all of these start to build towards a reference collection for studying Bronze Age metalwork fragments and also understanding the processes behind fragmentation rather than just considering them one-off broken bits and pieces. With my final few minutes, I want to go over some implications of this research and the future work that's required. Firstly, there is a clear difference between heating bronze for fragmentation and leaving it unheated. This is something that's well understood by metal workers, not understood quite so well by archaeologists studying the artifacts. The temperatures explored here were in the region of about 500 to 600 degrees Celsius, though other experiments have shown that even heating bronze to lower levels, like 100 degrees Celsius, will greatly improve the ease with which metal could be fragmented. These are not particularly high temperatures we're dealing with, and could easily be raised by anyone with a firm knowledge of fire making, which would have been common in prehistory. Furthermore, my experiments highlight that provided someone knew how the metal would behave, it would have been relatively easy to break bronze. As I've already stated, I'm not a metal worker, but once I understood the basic process, it was possible for me to quickly and easily fragment this material. However, we have to question how widespread such material knowledge was in the Bronze Age, and whether non-metal workers would have truly had a need for fragmenting metal. It doesn't particularly require specialist tools, but throughout my process I benefited greatly from the insights and knowledge of those metal workers I worked with. Worked with. We may perhaps infer that those with the material knowledge did have some involvement in the processes of destruction and perhaps the eventual deposition of Bronze Age metalwork. Lastly, we can return to this question of sacrifice or scrap. I'm not here to provide answers to this question, and there is certainly no one-size-fits-all response. But understanding that destruction events potentially involved a metal worker, that they would have required a fire and would have involved sensory and experiential aspects, including sight, sound, taste and feel, adds an evocative element to our understanding. This may help us see more mundane aspects of seemingly sacrificial offerings and also allows us to consider the more experiential and dare I say ritualistic aspects of fragmentation processes linked with recycling and scrapping. However, what I've presented today represents a starting point, not a conclusion. Anecdotally, I'm aware of lots of experiments that involve the breakage of objects, either through use or as part of the recycling process. But these are rarely published, if ever, if ever, and we need to expand the publication of these experiments. In addition, there's much to learn through metallography and comparisons between the results from experimental destruction and what is seen on artifacts. Ultimately, it is only through expanding this avenue of research that we will truly begin to understand the processes of destruction of metalwork, and I suspect in time this will force us to reinterpret how we come to view the practice of deposition in the Bronze Age. If anyone would like to know more about this research, please do get in touch. It's been published in the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society and Cornish Archaeology, and I'm happy to share off prints of these papers with anyone who drops me an email. On that note, I would like to thank you all for attending and listening to this talk. I want to acknowledge the following people for their support and assistance, particularly my supervisors at Exeter and Bristol, and Neil Burge for his enthusiastic encouragement and keen insights throughout my experiments. And finally, I would like to thank the Prehistoric Society for supporting this talk and to the AHRC for funding this research.